evening, everyone. It's good to see you. We're halfway through our module four, and tonight we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Interesting to note that the Old Testament is full of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, as we will see a little bit later on. By John chapter 16, Jesus was talking to his disciples about the promised Holy Spirit, and he said to them, that it is good, he says, um, because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. We all know Acts chapter 2, it was the fulfillment of the promise of the sending of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came in power, and again, I will refer to that a little bit later on, but Acts chapter 2 describes for us an historical event, like the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost represented a historical shift or a change. And when he was poured out, when he, when he came, <clears throat> when he was given by God uh, to his disciples, it marked a transition from the Old Testament era to the New Testament era when the Holy Spirit was going to be present, permanently present on earth. By the time Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, which is probably late in his third missionary journey before he went down to Jerusalem and where he was captured, Paul obviously had loads of time to think and reflect. And the way he describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8 is quite significant. And um, when, we, when we turn to Romans chapter 8, it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation, for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death in the previous chapters Paul grappled with the issue of the law and sin and the the human nature or the sinful nature or the flesh as he calls it uh, that wars against the the spirit inside of him and as he comes to chapter 8 he gives us this wonderful description of the role of the Holy Spirit when it, when it comes to our relationship with Christ. He says in verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that sinful nature, what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man, of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Verse 9, he says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. In other words, this is a, one of the major roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that is to put us under His control, under God's control, as opposed to living under the flesh or the human nature, nature's control. And so we no longer serve sin. It doesn't mean that we are sinless, but we no longer serve sin. We serve God through the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to describe that wonderful relationship we have with God. And he says in verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. In other words, being a son of God or a child of God. And by Him, by the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. One of the major roles of the Holy Spirit inside of us, living inside of us, is to keep us on track keep us in a relationship with God, keep us in an intimate relationship with God. God is my Father, and through the Spirit, and, 
and, and reminding us of the work that Jesus completed on the cross through the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, I know for sure, I know that I know based on His dwelling inside of me, and I know for sure based on the Scriptures, based on the promises and the truths of the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit lives in me, and therefore that I am a child of God. And that brings me into that intimate relationship with God. We're going to talk more about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and what He does for us. But here, I believe, is one of the fundamental truths about the Holy Spirit is coming into our lives and convincing us, convicting us of sin and then also bringing us into that relationship with God where I can call God my Father through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful truth. And let's pray together before we get into the lecture time. Dear Father, we thank you that you have adopted us as your children. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross to make it possible for us to know you, to know you personally, to have our sins forgiven, and to be adopted into the family of God and to be part of the kingdom of God, and to know you as our Lord, our God, our Savior. And through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to be enabled by the Spirit to live for you, to live in this relationship and to know in our hearts, to know in our minds and to know based on the Word of God that we belong to You. Thank You, Lord, for giving us the Holy Spirit. Thank You for pouring out the Spirit, giving the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And thank You that since then we can live knowing that the Spirit is available and always dwelling inside of us. Help us, Lord, to live by the power of Your Spirit. Fill us again with Your Spirit. Uh, enable us through your Spirit to do what you require us to do, to live for you, to produce or to live out this, the fruit of the Spirit, to receive your gifts and to use our gifts for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. And so, Lord, as we discuss the role, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit tonight, I pray that you would open our minds, our hearts, to, so that we may understand uh, the truths of your Word and to live by the truth of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we uh, look at the Holy Spirit. we putting another building block uh, into the building, into the, some foundational stuff that we believe. Uh, and the picture that I use in the title, the overall title for this course is The Big Picture. And I have in my, in my mind a picture on a large, large wall, way too large for me to even see in one go, because I don't have that sort of perspective. I live somewhere on this picture in 2011 or 2010 or 2012 or whenever uh, it is, and, and it's difficult for me to get out of my little hole and to look at this big picture. But tonight we... we uh, have another stroke on the canvas that God is busy painting of the picture of the world and the picture of eternity uh, in, a, in a sense. And uh, as we go on every week, we, we do more strokes on the canvas. We believe that there is a God. We believe that God created the universe. Those are important foundational strokes on the canvas, uh, if you wish. We believe that man was created by God or mankind that we sinned against God, and in a certain sense, the beautiful picture that God already painted by creating the universe and creating the world was marred. That picture was marred by sin entering uh, into the world. Fortunately, God has not left us to our own devices, but God pursued mankind. We, see that we saw that in Genesis chapter 3, when God came into the Garden of Eden, He already not only took the, the initiative by creating mankind, but He continued uh, the, the initiative by coming and pursuing His own human creation um, by, by offering salvation. In the Old Testament times, uh, He invited them into a faith relationship with Him, which found expression through the sacrificial system. And ultimately, He brought Jesus Christ into this world. And it is when Jesus comes that He begins to really correct that picture uh, of salvation, the Garden of Eden picture. And in principle, God has already done all of that, not only by creating the world and the universe, but by recreating it through Jesus Christ. That recreation will be perfect and complete 
once Jesus comes back at the second coming, all of which those things we believe. Now, last week we specifically looked at Jesus Christ, and uh, we saw that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God Himself. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We believe that Jesus came into this world, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. That is what Jesus came to do. And by coming into this world and being born with a human body, Jesus also, God, took upon Himself our humanity and lived in our place, died in our place, and thereby reconciled us with God. And this is now a free offer of salvation by God's grace. Uh, if we put our faith in God through Jesus, then Jesus lives inside of us. He is our Redeemer. He is the, the one who atoned for us. Uh, he is our high priest. He is our sacrifice. He is the one who shed his blood. It is through Jesus that our sins are washed away and that we come into a relationship with God. By putting our faith in God, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, by using the New Testament formula, Jesus Christ is Lord, by believing and accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. We are forgiven. We are declared righteous before God. Uh, we are adopted into God's family. We have peace with God. We, have, we live in peace with other people around us. And, and we enjoy all of the wonderful and marvelous privileges of being called children of God and being Christians and being reconciled with God, our Creator. So we now form part of that picture, that picture that God is busy not only painting but, but uh, restoring, the picture that He already painted in the Garden of Eden and creation. And God is busy restoring that picture. And as we will see next week, God invites us into uh, joining Him as He continues to restore that picture Ultimately, uh, when Jesus comes back, the picture will be finally, finally complete and completed. Now tonight, we look at the role of the Holy Spirit and a study of the person and the work uh, of the Holy Spirit with us. Now, if we understand who Jesus is, the second person of the Trinity, and Jesus came into this world, born of the Virgin Mary, He lived, He died, He rose again, and then He ascended to heaven, but He promised that He was going to come back then, it, of course, it begs the question, so what happens in the meantime? Between His ascension and His second coming, what happens during this time? And this is really where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit and the church. Now, next week we'll look at the church, but tonight we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit and the person and the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the Spirit was given to us as the third person of the Trinity, to represent God with us and in us and in this world. And it's the Holy Spirit who is working in the lives of sinners to bring them to God, to convict them of sin, as we have read in, in John chapter 16. It is the Holy Spirit who does the regeneration work in my life, as a, in me, in, in my life as a sinner. It is the Holy Spirit then who comes and dwells within me and enables me to live the Christian life. And therefore, the Holy Spirit is not just a little tag on at the end. The Holy Spirit plays a vital role in God's salvation economy, uh, if I can use that particular term. And so we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and who He is and how He works. And we'll look at some of the debates in Christianity around the Holy Spirit uh, as well. We may not come to a final conclusion. And being an interdenominational college, I try not to push hard for one particular view. I have my own views, of course, um, but uh, I understand that, that there are people out there who uh, have different views to mine, and there are many churches and denominations who hold different views when it comes to especially the practice of the Holy Spirit primarily. Uh, very seldom do we disagree on the person of the Holy Spirit. There are groups out there who may have different views, but most uh, churches out there in the world today believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. It is the precise way in which He works and, and the way that we apply the Holy Spirit's work in our own lives that Christians disagree uh, and different denominations disagree. In terms of the reading, there is a lot written in the Old Testament and said about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And so I refer to Genesis, Exodus, Second Chronicles 15, and then in the New Testament, John 14 and 16 in particular. 
um, if you, one wants to really read the context, you have to read uh, 14, 15, and 16. Um, but in chapters 14 and 16, you'll find a lot written about uh, the Holy Spirit as Jesus talks about his role. Acts chapter 2, I've referred to earlier on, and then Romans chapter 8. Those are some of the major chapters in terms of the person and some of the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12, and other passages that we will look at later on today will also make some good reading to find a, a comprehensive study and an overview of the role of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, the, the big word that we use for that is pneumatology. Now, in English, we don't pronounce the P in that word, but in Greek, we actually do. So, pneuma uh, means spirit. It can also be translated with the word wind. Um, and so, in theological terms, we talk about pneumatology, and uh, it comes from pneuma, which means either spirit or wind. And in this particular context, it obviously refers to the word spirit or Holy Spirit. So, a study of the spirit or a study of the Holy Spirit uh, is called pneumatology. By way of introduction, there are many debates and disagreements in Christian circles, as I pointed out already, um, about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, especially regarding His work in the life of the Christian, and then also the way churches need to promote and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work. And, and this is where the debates go in different uh, directions, and also practice go, uh, uh, goes in different directions. Christians in evangelical churches uh, mostly agree on the person of the Holy Spirit uh, and when he enters into the life of the person. It is around the baptism of or with the Holy Spirit that th there are some disagreements which we will look at later on. And then in particular how the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate in a local church as well as in the, in the life of uh, an individual believer. As we go into tonight, I just want to put down a few ground rules for myself and for us, uh, even as we discuss and debate the Holy Spirit. The first is that we have to stay within the boundaries of Scripture. When we talked about angelology and demonology, the spirit world, I highlighted this particular truth, and that is we cannot take what has happened to another person by way of a vision or an experience, and they may have a wonderful and very legitimate kind of experience with either an angel or a demon, and now for tonight's uh, uh, discussion uh, with the Holy Spirit, and we cannot take what another person has described and make that the standard for every other person in the world to say, my experience with the Holy Spirit has to be your experience as well. By way of, ex by way of illustration, um, we, we believe that there are many different ways in which people come to know Christ. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I do, however, vividly remember at the age of five. I was only five years old. And I do remember praying a little prayer of salvation, Jesus come and live in my heart, sort of uh, invitation. But I cannot go around the world and now preach that at the age of five, everybody must pray a prayer and say, please come and live in my heart. Because there are many, many different ways in which people come to a conviction of their sin and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Some people have a date and a time. They can tell you the exact moment when they made a decision to follow Christ. Many others don't have that moment. My wife, Joan, is one of those. She doesn't have an exact moment. But again, growing up in a Christian home, uh, faith is something that grew in her heart. And if you ask her today, she would give a very clear explanation of the fact that she's a Christian and why she's a Christian and why she believes in Jesus Christ. But she can't point to a particular time uh, as, as I can. And then, of course, there are many people who have lived a very, very ugly, uh, sinful life. Uh, God spoke to them. The Holy Spirit came into the uh, work, worked in their lives, and they came at a moment. They, they can still vividly remember listening to a sermon or picking up the Bible and praying a prayer, and they even wrote the date in their Bible. So what, the point I'm trying to make is that as with our conversion. We cannot make one single experience of coming either to Christ or having an experience with the Holy Spirit as uh, general and universal for everybody. There are certain principles and guidelines in the Scriptures that I believe we should follow, which is why I say we've got to stay within the boundaries of Scripture. We have to apply 
even when we then go to the scriptures, we have to apply good hermeneutical rules or principles of interpretation. I cannot take a verse and simply take it out of context and build a whole theology uh, around that. We have, uh, I've already referred to the fact that many false doctrines actually go that particular route. And then we also should base all of our beliefs on the Bible and not on our own or anyone else's experience, basically affirming uh, what I've already said. When it comes to the Holy Spirit and the Bible, we believe that the Holy Spirit is a third person in the Trinity, and you will look in vain in the Bible to find the word Trinity there. I, we've, we've said that when we talked about God. The word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. I've just recently read through church history once again, the early church history. And um, it's an interesting journey. In fact, it's not, a, it's not an easy one to really get your mind around. Because Christianity spread very rapidly around the known world, around the whole Mediterranean. With Christians living in North Africa, they lived in, um, in, the, in Asia, uh, in uh, what is today modern-day Turkey. It spread into Europe, into the West, and into the East, and all over the place. And so we're talking about major distances. And obviously people then started holding different beliefs and so on. And so the first two, three hundred years of Christianity, I believe God was working in a way in guiding the church in a particular direction, in coming to an understanding and a belief about God uh, the concept of the Trinity is not something that, as I said, you find in exactly those words. We believe in the Trinity. That's something that the church came to an understanding about, based on solid interpretation of the Scriptures. Now, again, if you could then go to the Bible and look for the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, again, you look in vain, because that particular term or terminology is not used in the Bible. It is based on our understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. We track the references in the Old Testament and then move into the New Testament where you begin to get the picture of the Holy Spirit as God, as the third person in the Trinity, and, and whether we should even use the word first, second, and third. Again, it's, it's just, I guess, terminology we use to make it easier for us to try uh, and get our human minds around this very mysterious big uh, faith that we, that we express. The uh, fact of the matter is that we read quite a bit about the Spirit uh, in the Old Testament and sometimes is referred to as the Spirit of God. We have more references to the Spirit, even in Genesis 1 already, we read about the Holy Spirit or the Spirit hovering over uh, the unformed earth or the unformed universe. But as in the case of Jesus, it is in the New Testament that the picture begins to come together. There's a, there's a, 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 a let's call it a blurred picture in the Old Testament of the Spirit. And it's, a, it's a, quite an extensive one, but it still remains relatively blurred until the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is now on the forefront and described, acknowledged by Jesus, described by Jesus, promised by Jesus, and, and when you look at the total picture, then you get a very clear picture about the Spirit of God and who He is. And therefore, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we have to study all of Scripture. We, we are not limited to the New Testament, and certainly if we, we feel like we're limited to the Old Testament, I believe we will have a very limited understanding uh, of the Old Testament, uh, of the Holy Spirit and His work. Talking about the, the person of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, in a statement of faith, a very early statement of faith, uh, which has been affirmed by the councils of Nicaea in 325, and then also the council of Constantinople in 381, uh, this is what it says. And here is a direct quote from Kevin Roy's notes. It says, An early Christian creed produced by the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople defines the Holy Spirit as, and this is the quote from the, uh, the creed, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And Kevin says, this sums up the consensus of Christian teaching about the person of the Holy Spirit at that time. A consensus that has uh, remained to the present time. 
there's very little that one can improve on this particular statement and that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit represents God. He came from God and that He spoke in the Old Testament. He came and dwelled upon Jesus Christ and He continues to be with us even uh, till today. Now, oftentimes people wonder why we then refer to Him as the Holy Spirit. It is true that most of the references in the Old Testament to the Spirit uh, are to simply the Spirit or the Spirit of God. Psalm 51 verse 11 is the first time in the Old Testament that we find a reference to the Holy Spirit. And that is when David prays. And Isaiah chapter 63 verse 11 has the only other reference in the Old Testament to the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? It means that the Spirit of God is holy, just as God is holy. We need to understand the word holy as being separate, as being distinct, as being uh, clean and, and sanctified is, is another word. In fact, the word sanctified in the Bible oftentimes is a similar word to the one to holy or holiness or living holy. And as part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit therefore is sinless. And that is one reason why we refer to Him as the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is also spirit. Like God, He is spirit. John 4 verse 24, Jesus refers to God as spirit and therefore needs to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And some of the older translations use the word Holy Ghost. And the word ghost, I don't think, is a very happy translation. And so I think most of us today would agree uh, with the translation spirit rather than, than ghost. In many of our minds, a ghost is something you, you get afraid of and you, you want to steer clear uh, of those kind of ghosts. ghosts. But uh, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is more than just a spirit, a force, or a power. He is a person. He is a personal being. Uh, there are loads of places in the Bible where He, he speaks to people. He guides people. Um, he can be um, uh, working with power in people's lives. And as I said, He can speak to them. Uh, we can also disappoint the Holy Spirit. And when, when it's only a power or a wind or a force out there, then those references in the, in the Bible would make very little sense. Uh, most of those references refer to someone who is a person. He's never referred to as an it, but always as a he uh, or with a personal pronoun. Jesus referred to him as another paraclete or another counselor. In John chapter 16, we read that right at the beginning. Jesus said, when I go away, I will send you another counselor. And it's interesting to note that the word that is used, uh, paraclete, that is used for the Holy Spirit is also used for Jesus in 1 John chapter 2, in the first couple of verses. Jesus is referred to as our counselor, and the same word, the exact same word is used, paraclete. And um, so the Holy Spirit and Jesus therefore have similar titles when it comes to the role of, the, of uh, both Jesus and the Spirit in our own lives. The Holy Spirit and the Trinity. The third person in the Trinity is, is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. And oftentimes we refer to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. He receives the same adoration and worship as the Father and the Son as, is, as implied in the baptismal formula. When Jesus says, uh, said to His disciples, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is put on an equal footing to the Father uh, and the Son in Acts chapter 5. And, and this is an interesting reference just in case you uh, have doubts about this. Uh, he is equated with God. It is the story of Ananias and Sapphira uh, when they came and um, just in terms of the context, uh, they sell a property and they lie about the price that they received for the property in order to, it seems like, to gain a little bit of standing and honor for themselves. They bring an amount of money and they say, here is the full amount uh, that we want to give to the church uh, which we receive for the property. But they are lying. It's not the full amount. They have already kept some of that apart. Now, Peter's argument was and is that 
the, the property belonged to them. God did not take the property from them. It was their own free will to bring the, the money for the property. They didn't have to lie about the money. They could have brought 10% or 5% or 50% of the, of the money of the property, and it would have been fine. But they lied, and the way uh, Peter goes about this uh, emphasizes the role of the Holy Spirit, and this is what I want to refer to. And then Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept your, for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Now, in this particular reference, it sounds like Peter was expecting him to bring all the money. But later on, Peter said, and, and this is what he says, Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, you, you could make the call on uh, a, 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 about how you wanted to use the money or the property. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to me, but to God. Now, that's the interesting connection. Just two sentences before, he said, uh, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Now, Peter says, you have not lied to me, you have lied to God. So, he's equating God and the Holy Spirit in two, three sentences apart. The Holy Spirit is described as a creator or the creator in Job chapter 33. And I've already referred to Genesis. In Genesis, in the first couple of verses of chapter 1, the, the Spirit is already mentioned. By way of illustration, just as the human spirit is part of the human person, I have spirit inside of me. As I'm, I'm more than just physical substance. In the same way, there is spirit in God. Uh, the Spirit of God is with God, and the Spirit knows what is going on in the mind of God. That's one of uh, Paul's arguments in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 to 16, where he talks about the Spirit uh, seeks the mind of God, uh, just as, as I know what is going on in my mind. So the Spirit knows that, and the Spirit is the one who reveals the mind of God uh, to us. Several of the names um, that, is you, that are used for the Holy Spirit are mentioned in the Bible. The Hebrew word for ruach, uh, I have already referred to pneuma, the uh, Greek word, which is the exact same meaning as the Hebrew word. Both can be translated with either spirit or wind, and only the context will tell you. Sometimes you're standing out in nature, there's a description of the wind that blows, um, and it may even be that Jesus in John chapter 3 uh, is actually playing with the word, uh, in that particular case is Greek, so he's playing with the word pneuma, and he says to Nicodemus in John 3, um, just as the wind blows, and you can't really see the wind, but you see the effect of the wind, in the same way the person was born of the Spirit. And it's a play on words there, because the exact same word for Spirit and wind uh, is used. And, and only the context tells you that Jesus is using an illustration of wind, which he then applies to a person who is born of the Spirit. The, the Greek word parakletos, the paraklete, I've used that or referred to that already, uh, it is sometimes translated as counselor. In other words, someone who gives me advice, someone who comes alongside. In fact, that is the major uh, uh, sort of area of meaning of the word paraclete is coming alongside. If I'm there to help you, to assist you, to give you advice, to physically help you, then I am a paraclete. Uh, the word comforter is sometimes trans, uh, used as a translation. The word advocate, again, it's someone who speaks on my behalf. Uh, I am facing the judge and the advocate, the paraclete is there to speak on my behalf, to represent me. He's a helper. Um, and then he is also called the Spirit of God, and he's sometimes called the Spirit of Jesus. So, uh, loads of different words and terms used for the Holy Spirit. You page through the, the Bible, you will find many symbols used for the Holy Spirit. The symbol of flame or fire associated with the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit comes into my life, it's almost like He burns the chaff away. He burns all the sin out of my life. It's part of a, a picture or a symbol, an image, that is used to help us understand what He does. I've already referred to wind. Uh, it's associated with the power and the force of the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit can't be touched 
Uh, he is not substance like we understand it. And therefore, the Holy Spirit moves in ways that we can't necessarily always see and understand. We can see the effect. And that is the point that Jesus was making to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He was saying, um, you need to be born from above or born again. The, the word can be translated with either of those. And, and Nicodemus obviously understands it wrongly. He says, how can I go back in the womb of my mother and be born again? But Jesus was not referring to that. He said, you really need to be born of the Spirit. And that is an inner working of the Spirit that, that no human person can do. Uh, I cannot do it for myself. I can't, I can't do it for anybody else. Uh, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge, but it's also a wonderful comfort. Because as I speak to another person and try and c convince them that they need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, I also know that on the one hand, I'm an instrument sharing the gospel with them. On the other hand, I can't save them. I can't do this rebirth thing. That is a work of the wind. That's the work of the Spirit coming into that person's life. Another symbol used is the symbol of dove. At the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. I believe it re re represents the quiet, gentle way in which the Holy Spirit works in the lives of, of people. Uh, there have been many times in my life where the Holy Spirit just gently guided me, either through a word from someone else, through the Scriptures, or just a conviction, a, a total conviction in my heart that just grew. Uh, and it's a gentle way in which the Spirit is guiding me. Uh, and that's the symbol or the s symbolic meaning of the dove. He is often referred to as the breath of God, symbolizing the way that God breathes life into human beings. Uh, in Adam, he, he breathed uh, his uh, his uh, life-giving breath into Adam and he became a living being. And in a similar way, when people are dead in their sins, God through His Holy Spirit comes and He breathes into their lives the salvation that we need from the Lord Jesus Christ. The symbol of oil is often used, especially in the Old Testament, as the anointing or the blessing of God. And it really means a consecration, a setting aside, a setting apart. We've talked about Jesus last week uh, representing three different offices in the Old Testament. All three of those offices, king, priest, um, and prophet, were often anointed and set aside, consecrated for the job that they needed to do. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit comes into my life and I'm consecrated to God. I now belong to God. Um, I'm in His service. And then also living water. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as living water that will well up in the person and become a stream of water in the person. And it refers to God's life-giving power. Um, if you have ever been in a desert or you've been tired uh, and, and dry and thirsty, um, it, when, when, when you have water and water comes into your mouth, it brings, it revives the, 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 the life of the person. And in a similar way, the Spirit, sometimes we go through our dry patches, even in our Christian lives. And the Holy Spirit is like water that comes into our lives and revives the soul, uh, gives us new life and um, helps us to serve God better. Now, that's the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have not given you many biblical references tonight, uh, but if you page through the Bible and through the New Testament, and even if you have a concordance, and you just look up all the verses related to the Holy Spirit, you will get a fairly comprehensive picture of the person of the Holy Spirit, and more of that will come to light as we continue to, walk, to, to uh, talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. What does He do? Again, backing into the Old Testament, we find the Spirit at work in the Old Testament. Um, I have now referred to it several times, but in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we read how God created, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I, I don't have a clear picture in my mind about exactly what was happening over here, but somehow, and this is enough for me for the moment, somehow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, was there uh, actively involved in creation. As we saw last week, 
the moment you get into the New Testament, we read how Jesus is the Creator. So, God, God the Father, created. The Holy Spirit was present, creating, and Jesus was there creating. The clearest picture that we have in, in uh, Genesis is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, let us, in the plural, let us make man in our image. Who was he referring to? Probably the Trinity, although the word Trinity is obviously not used over there. But the Holy Spirit was active in human beings in general. Uh, Numbers chapter 24, and I'm going to read that as well. Verse 2. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to sorcery as at other times, but turned his face towards the desert. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he uttered this oracle, and then it was a blessing to Israel. Now here is again one of those mysteries of the Old Testament in my mind, and that's the existence of Balaam. And to what extent Balaam had access to God. But the one thing I do read over here, I mean, that is a mystery to me. Uh, where Balaam fits into the whole picture of God and how God operated in the Old Testament. But in this particular case, what is very clear to me is that Balaam was simply uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit because God is ultimately in control. And the Spirit of God is God. And therefore, God somehow, through His Spirit, entered into Balaam's life. In fact, every time Balaam tried to curse Israel, the words that came out of his mouth, because he was under the control of the Spirit of God, and therefore accountable to God, it became a blessing rather than a curse. And so, in general, even outside of Israel, it seems like God's Spirit was at work. And then, specifically... Uh, he operated in Israel. There is a description of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, where Saul came under the influence of the Spirit and he started prophesying. Um, we need to understand that against a whole description, some of which we don't know exactly how it originated, but of prophecy and how prophecy operated in the Old Testament. And as far back as the time of Samuel, um, Samuel was a prophet, and when Saul was anointed to become king, Saul ended up among uh, some, of, some of the prophets. He probably came across a prophetic school or a school of the prophets somehow, and the Spirit of God entered him, and he started uttering uh, prophecies. What that looked like, how it operated, we have no uh, means of discovering that anymore. But he enabled people to uh, prophesy, he equipped people to do specific tasks. Um, and here we have to go back to uh, Exodus chapter 31. When Moses led the people out uh, of Egypt and he started talking about uh, making certain things and the ark and, and the tent of meeting and so on in chapter 31 of Exodus verse 3. Um, let me just read from verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen... Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, um, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Now, the interesting reference over here is that the Holy Spirit had a very practical role to play in the life of this particular person. Uh, we would call him a, um, a craftsman, uh, maybe even an artist, uh, to be able to do certain things. Does that mean that every person in the world who's, who's an, arts, uh, an, an artist or a craftsman, uh, craftsperson, uh, filled by the Holy Spirit? Well, it's a yes and a no. It's a, it's a no in the sense that there is a specific work of the Holy Spirit, especially when we come to the New Testament. But there is also a general work of the Holy Spirit, and we've talked about that already, and that is the image of God living in every person out there. And if the Holy Spirit is God, it means that the Spirit also, in some sense, is dwelling in people out there in the world. Because the image of God, it's a 
disturbed image. It's a broken image of God, but it is the image of God nonetheless. And so certain people have skills. They have abilities. Where do they get those abilities? They get it from God. God created them. God still enables them to do those kinds of things. Sometimes they write wonderful material. Um, authors in this world write wonderful stuff, not from a Christian perspective, but very solid and good and wonderful stuff that we can read and learn from. And uh, here we have uh, a, a person who has been especially equipped by God to do crafts and arts. And um, I believe that this is a further role of the Holy Spirit. And those of us who are Christians are filled by the Holy Spirit, and He can enable us to do things that we previously were not able to do and to become artists or craftspeople. Uh, the Holy Spirit also empowered individuals to lead these people. Again and again, we find the Spirit of God coming upon a person and indwelling a person, especially in the book of Judges. We also have references in Numbers chapter 11 to people who have been filled by the Spirit to lead His people, to lead God's flock or God's people uh, in this world. So many different ways in which the Holy Spirit operated uh, in the Old Testament. We have to say a word about the permanency of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. Now, it is true that the Spirit of God worked in many different ways in the Old Testament. However, His work, it seems like, was limited to generally filling people with the image of God or reflecting the image of God, very generally speaking. But when it came to very specifically filling people for a specific task, as we will be looking at in the New Testament a bit later on, we find that He came upon certain people but also was able to leave them. Saul is such a case. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, uh, the Spirit came upon him, but then later in chapter 16, the Spirit of God was removed from Saul. It's interesting to note that, that David was very afraid and prayed that, the, that God would not remove his Holy Spirit from him. The very fact that David was able to pray that prayer meant that at least David had an understanding that the Spirit can be given to him, but also taken away from him. We have an interesting reference to Samson. Who did, not, uh, who did not understand or realize that God has left him, that the Spirit of God has left him when his hair was cut. He thought he was just going to go out as before and just demolish the Philistines, but he didn't realize that God had actually withdrawn his presence from him, from Samson. And so it seems like in the Old Testament we have uh, a coming and a going of the special work of the Holy Spirit. As I said, just as in general revelation, we have specific revelation. Now we have the general work of God in people because He created all of us. It's by God that we live and move and have our being, to quote the Apostle Paul. But, but the Spirit comes very specifically and works in the lives of certain individuals. In the Old Testament, we have several of those examples, but then we also have examples of the Spirit being withdrawn uh, in terms of His special work in those people's lives. And therefore, it seems like the Old Testament had an expectation that somewhere in the future there will be a more permanent role and a permanent outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 describe that very clearly. And this is going to become important as we continue uh, to look at the role of the Holy Spirit. Now if we turn to Joel uh, chapter 2, Verse 28, and afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors whom the Lord calls. It's interesting, on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes this particular reference as the fulfillment of this prophecy. 
So years before the coming of Jesus, already there was this expectation, a growing expectation that somewhere in the future, God was going to do something wonderful and new. You have to look at this particular prophecy in the light of all of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament, somehow or the other, uh, expected God to work in, in the future. We have looked at Ezekiel and the replacing of the heart of stone with a, the with a heart of flesh. Forgiveness, uh, living in peace. Um, there are many, many prophecies in the Old Testament about some future reality. So you can't isolate Joel and say um, that is um, just the only thing we're going to look at in terms of the expectation of the Holy Spirit. Of course it refers here specifically to the Holy Spirit and it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. But it was only fulfilled because you look at it in the context of all of the prophecies of the Old, Old Testament referring to a new thing that God was going to do uh, somewhere in the future. Now, in, on the day of Pentecost, on, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, that expectation was fulfilled. And uh, we know the story well, but it may be good for us just to refresh our memory. Um, after the ascension of Jesus described in Acts chapter 1, uh, the, uh, several disciples and others are, are in the upper room and they waiting and praying and replacing uh, Judas with Matthias. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. You see two symbols already here. There's wind and there's tongues of fire. There's fire. Two of the symbols used for the Holy Spirit. Um, and the fire, those tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were God-fearing people and the, all sorts of places around the world. And these were primarily Jews who came from around the world to be in, in uh, Jerusalem during the time of the feast. And they heard them speak in their own language, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in verse 11. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. And then Peter stood up and he said, well, They're not drunk. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only, the, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes that exact same passage that I read from uh, Joel chapter 2. This event, the day of Pentecost, ranks with all of the once-off events in the Bible, such as the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus on the cross. He will never die again. There will, be, there will never be another crucifixion. The resurrection of Jesus, He rose once and for all. And the day of Pentecost is a once-for-all day. In other words, on that day, God, in a new way, gave His Spirit. We, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit was already present. He is God and God is everywhere. He was already at work in the Old Testament era. But here on the day of Pentecost, God fulfilled a prophecy and a promise in the Old Testament. And this is a once for all. However, having said that, we now live in the uh, reality of the Holy Spirit being present. And the Holy Spirit being a person and being dynamic, uh, He comes to different people at different times. Uh, in terms of a, a salvation historical event, Pentecost can never be repeated. It's a once-off event. But in the light of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit can come to different people at different times and also in different ways. In John chapter 7, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit as that living water that will well up. And, he, and, and then John makes the comment, I'm not going to turn there right now, but John makes the comment, and this is said about the Holy Spirit who is yet to be given. In other words, even during the time of Jesus on earth, that particular event has not yet happened. Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, represents that time when the Holy Spirit uh, was given. Now what does the Holy Spirit do today? In the same way that Jesus was called Emmanuel, uh, God with us, the Holy Spirit is now God with us. He doesn't have that name necessarily, but this is God with us in a new way. The way that I figure this out in my own mind is, as long as Jesus was on earth and limited to a human body, albeit a resurrected body, 
he was not going to multiply his body by millions so that he can be at, in the same place at the same time always um, with, with, with his physical body. So as long as, as long as he was here in a body, he was limited to the disciples or whoever seeing him with his physical body. And he said to them, it's, it's for your benefit that I go away, because if I go, the Holy Spirit will come, and the Spirit has no limit. He's everywhere, and is around the world, and lives in hundreds and thousands and millions of Christians around the world, and He is, therefore, God with us. The Holy Spirit was given to be God with us in a new and a dynamic way, and He's at work in the world and in the church everywhere, uh, wherever you look and wherever you go around the world in the church and in Christians' lives. Now we're going to take a break right there and then we'll talk about the work of the Holy Spirit when we come back and we'll also uh, talk about some of those things that Christians disagree about. As we uh, start the second part of this lecture tonight, uh, we'll look at the work of the Holy Spirit, some of the aspects of the Spirit, especially when we look at the New Testament era. Uh, we live in the New Testament era, so we obviously need to take a look at the Spirit from that particular angle without ignoring the way the Spirit worked in the Old Testament. But we've looked at that already. From a New Testament perspective, the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of sin. This is a similar work to what he was doing in the Old Testament. You can imagine David praying, saying, God, please don't remove your Spirit, don't take your Spirit from me. Because if God would have done that, then the convicting work of the Spirit is no longer there. In other words, in a certain sense, David was probably also saying, I, I don't want to just live in sin with no conviction about sin. And so part of what the Spirit does is to convict us of, of sin. John chapter 16 describes that. And then he enables sinners, uh, when they begin to understand that they are lost, uh, of the fact that they need Jesus. And a simple statement in New Testament 1, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We find that repeated several times when Paul speaks to different people and they have this conviction, what must we do? And then uh, Peter said to them on, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, uh, repent uh, of your sin. Uh, Paul said to them, believe in the Lord Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of sin and then to bring us to Jesus because Jesus died for our sins and in and, and through Jesus Christ we have salvation. He convicts the world of, of, of guilt, uh, that is sin, in John 16, 8 and also of righteousness, righteousness and judgment. Without the Spirit working in the world, um, people out there will, will not be aware of the fact that there is a God and that they uh, have sinned against Him. No sinner can see his or her own sin. No sinner can come to that uh, understanding of a lost condition unless it is the Holy Spirit who operates in our hearts and in our lives. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin initially, bringing us to Christ, and it is the ongoing role of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. Even as a Christian, it is the Holy Spirit inside of me who whispers and makes me feel guilty uh, because I have sinned. It is the Holy Spirit then, after a person has been convicted of sin and lostness, uh, who regenerates, and in other, in other words, who renews us. Uh, to those who believe the good news about Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives new birth. And uh, well, I've already quoted Jesus saying that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He renews sinners, he baptizes them into the body of Christ. In other words, he, it is the Holy Spirit, who makes us part of the body of Jesus Christ. And this is a a key verse that I really need to read uh, for us, First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Verse 12 says, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by or in, uh, you can translate that word either way, one spirit, by one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. It is through the spirit that we become part of the body of Jesus Christ, the body being the church worldwide of Jesus. And it's the spirit who takes us after making us new and then putting us into the body of believers, making us part of the church of Jesus Christ in this world. Paul puts it well in, in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. And uh, part of that reads like this. It says, God saved us 
through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. And just incidentally, here you have um, the reference to the Trinity once again in one particular context. But uh, the point that Paul is making over here is that the Holy Spirit has been given to us generously, generously through Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit who brings us to new birth. He is the one who regenerates us. And this means that God saves sinners by the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who convicts us of sin. And then he brings us to understand what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And that's why we put our faith in Jesus. And Jesus also said, the Holy Spirit will bring honor to me. The Holy Spirit will remind you of my words. And the role of the Holy Spirit is bringing people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit never honors or glorifies himself. He brings people, he brings sinners to Christ. And it's in Christ that they find uh, salvation. No one can become a Christian unless he or she is convicted by the Spirit and brought to faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, You cannot be a Christian unless the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, lives in you. It is then the Holy Spirit, after convicting me of sin, bringing me to new life, who then indwells my life. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Those who are born again by the Spirit are also indwelled by Him. Both my body, the body of the believer, as well as the body of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus, both are described as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Interesting concept. Uh, for the Jews, they believe, even till today, if you go to Israel, they can't wait for the Temple Mount to be occupied once again so that a third temple can be built. Uh, if you walk in the Western Tunnel, for example, there's a specific a specific place where you come and according to the calculations by the Jews today uh, they believe that is the closest you will get to the Holy of Holies and that is a very holy little place because you are so close to the Holy of Holies um, and, and the reason for that is that is where God God's presence dwelt uh, the Holy Presence was on the, and, and on the Ark in the Holy of Holies, which is why no person can go there. Even if you go to Israel today, as you walk up the ramp to go up to the uh, Temple Mount, which is occupied by uh, Muslims, of course, uh, but there is a note by the Jewish rabbi, the head rabbi, which says you are entering holy ground and you need to be careful where you step, where you step or where you tread, um, meaning that they don't necessarily know exactly where the Holy of Holies was, and no normal human being can go there except the, holy, the, the high priest once a year. And so that's a holy place. And the, the God dwelt in His temple. That was symbolically the representative uh, of, of His presence on earth. And it's therefore interesting to note that Paul and other New Testament authors take the, the concept of the church and now even my body as an individual and the Holy Spirit and therefore God dwelling in me. And, and now we are called the temple of God the temple of the Holy Spirit. I, as, a, as an individual Christian, and together collectively as a church, we represent the temple of God in the New Testament era. In and through Jesus Christ, uh, the, Holy the, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. These followers are being built together to become a dwelling in which, car, uh, in which Christ dwells by His Spirit. Uh, there's another image, and Peter uses that same image again, that we are being built up into a holy dwelling. And we are all living stones with Christ being the, the chief cornerstone. And Paul uses a similar image when he talks about working in the church as working on a building where the foundation is the apostles and the chief cornerstone is Jesus and we are the living stones being built. And so the church is this temple. That is the New Testament temple. And in that sense, we don't need another temple. We will never need another temple. The church on the corner will never be the temple. That is simply a building where we gather. We, as people, make up the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. But the assurance is that He lives in me. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. He lives in me. And being in me and dwelling in me, it is also, therefore, the Holy Spirit's work to assure me of salvation. In Romans chapter, 12, uh, chapter 8, uh, verse, verses 12 to 17, we, we read, and, and I'm not going to read it again because we read it earlier on, but 
we, we read how the Spirit dwells in us and He is the one who reminds me that I have been adopted as God's child. Um, people who have adopted children, and especially back in those days in the Roman Empire, uh, there were Roman laws that uh, prescribed the adoption rules. And when a person, a child, has been adopted into a family, that, that child is legally part of that family and can inherit in a similar way to any of the, um, the, the people, the, the normal children born into that, that family. Um, and, and in a similar way, when God adopts us as His children, we are legally God's children. And it's the Holy Spirit who dwells in me, who helps me then to pray, says Romans chapter 8. And Paul says a similar thing in Galatians chapter 4, where we then cry out and we say, Abba, Father. It's the Spirit in us and through us who makes this connection with God the Father. And He helps us to pray, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit, says Paul, who testifies with my spirit, the Holy Spirit testifying with my spirit and assuring me of salvation, which is why no Christian ever should doubt their salvation. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts me of sin. He regenerates me. It is He who puts me into the family of God. It is He who dwells in me. It is the Holy Spirit who says to me in my mind and in my heart and through the Scriptures, I am God's child, and therefore I never have to doubt that. As Christians read and hear the promises of God and the Word of God in the Bible, the Holy Spirit enables us to have that assurance and to know for sure that God loves me, God has shown His mercy to me, and God has saved me. It is the Holy Spirit who baptizes believers. Uh, we talk about the baptism of or with the Holy Spirit. The prophets promised that the Messiah would baptize His disciples with the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2, uh, in John chapter 1 verse 33, we have John the Baptist saying that He who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So there was always that promise into the future, indicating the dawning of, of a, a new era. Um, this was confirmed by Jesus, and uh, we already referred to John chapter 7. Let me, let me just read that verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, and this is a comment by John the author, by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in Him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. In other words, there was still an outstanding promise to be fulfilled. Jesus also referred to that in John chapter 14, when He talks about the Spirit that is going to come. After He goes, then the Spirit uh, will come, and that was fulfilled uh, on the day of Pentecost, of course. All believers are baptized with or in or by the Holy Spirit. Again, the little word is a little Greek word. Uh, the little Greek word is literally in, and it can be in or by or with, and depending on the context um, how you translate that. But um, people were going to be baptized, and when a person becomes a Christian, when the Holy Spirit who is the one who works in the sinner's life already, regenerates that sinner, um, brings that sinner to Jesus Christ so that their sins can be forgiven, then the Holy Spirit is the one who dunks them, baptizes them into the body of Jesus Christ. And in that sense, every person receives the Holy Spirit in full and in His fullness when you, are a, when you become a Christian, when you are reborn. At the same time, Christians are commanded to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It seems like we have, to use the illustration, we are full of cracks. So somehow we, we leak and the Holy Spirit, in terms of His control over our lives, is not constant. Not that the Holy Spirit is not constant. We are the problem. 
we don't always devote our lives to the Lord as we should or to the Spirit as we should. And therefore, we don't allow Him to control our lives as we should. And therefore, in Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, and he gives a command, and he says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he uses the present continuous tense. In other words, on an ongoing basis, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Interesting, when you go to the book of Acts, again and again, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, the, and it's talking about the disciples. They, were, they received the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but then after that, the Spirit filled them, controlled them, filled them, um, sh uh, shook the building once again, came again on them in power. So there seems to be an ongoing experience with the Holy Spirit that is needed, which is what Paul calls uh, you, need to be continue, you need to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is also the Holy Spirit who sanctifies believers. I've used this word before, and I said it's related to holiness. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit, and that's, that's where the emphasis comes from. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit who cannot tolerate sin. And therefore, it is the Holy Spirit who will convict me on an ongoing basis of sin in my life, even as a Christian. Now that I'm a Christian, I continue to sin. First John chapter 1 and 2 very clearly state that we continue to sin. Uh, we shouldn't, but we do. And if we do, the Holy Spirit inside of us will convict us, He will convince us, and He will then help us to confess our sins. I often ask this question, and that is, uh, when I feel like I'm lost and I'm guilty and I want to run away from God, who is at work in my life? My normal response to that is, the devil. The devil is the one who accuses me of sin before God. And he wants me to feel guilty to the point of turning away and running away from God. The Holy Spirit also talks to me about my sin. But the Holy Spirit wants to turn me towards God. And he wants me, the guilt that I feel about my sin, he wants that feeling to drive me to God in order to receive God's forgiveness. And so this is the distinction that we need to make between the devil accusing me and making me want to run away from God, whereas the Holy Spirit in me wants, wants to convict me of sin and drive me to God so that I can get receive forgiveness uh, of sins. Through salvation by grace, a sinner is forgiven, brought into the very presence of God. And in that sense, I am holy. I am sanctified. Through Jesus Christ, I can enter into the presence of God. We, we said that last week when we looked at Jesus and what He did for us. Jesus, on the basis of Jesus' death, I can enter into the presence of God. In that sense, I am already sanctified. However, we, because we continue to sin... We have an ongoing struggle with sin. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and 7 clearly state that. And, uh, and also in 1 John chapter 1, as I said. And, and therefore, the Holy Spirit inside of me will convict me of that sin. And He is the one who continues to sanctify me. In other words, I'm not perfect yet. I am perfect in Christ, but I'm not perfect yet in terms of this life. And that's an ongoing life. And the Holy Spirit is there to help me with what we call sanctification. Uh, the, the, the struggle of sanctification, becoming holier uh, as we continue to live in this life. It is also the Holy Spirit who empowers us as believers. It is He who has been given to both individuals, to me, and to us as a church, uh, to the church of Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives us the power to do what we in our own strength do not have uh, the power to do. He's given to enable Christians to be witnesses. In, in uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power to be my witnesses. And so, for us to be witnesses of Jesus, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and to enable us to do what in our human strength we will never, ever be able to do. 
The Spirit also gives gifts to enable the body of Jesus Christ to operate properly. Romans chapter 12, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, both of those chapters have long descriptions about, of, of the, the different types of gifts that the Holy Spirit is giving to different people in the church so that together, collectively, they can operate properly as the body of Jesus Christ doing, again, what they are in their own human strength uh, do not have the ability to do. The Holy Spirit is also the one who equips us. He equips us to display the characteristics of that of a Christian. A person who belongs to God should be gentle and loving and kind and long-suffering and all those wonderful things that we in our own strength do not have. I don't have those abilities in and of myself, and they remain an ongoing struggle. And uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul puts it this way. And uh, the context here is very clear that uh, Paul is talking about people who are steeped in sin. They live a sinful lifestyle. And he says, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be living that sort of life. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And he said this in other contexts in Romans 8 and other places as well. For the sinful nature, the flesh, desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit contrary to what is uh, to, to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are, un, you are not under law. And then he, he has a list of sinful acts. In other words, the sinful nature in me used to, and still to some extent, uh, wants me to live a sinful life. And he lists them. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and selfish ambition, and the list is long. Then he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, what the, the Spirit is producing in my life should look like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such, uh, things, uh, against such things there is no law. And then he says, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified their old lives. It is the Holy Spirit dwelling in me who is fertilizing the soil, if you wish. It is the Holy Spirit who waters the soil, who grows the tree. And, and ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit and, and the way that I submit my life to the Holy Spirit and the way that I am um, filled with the Holy Spirit, submit, submission to the Holy Spirit, ultimately will bring forth these kind of fruits or characteristics, love, joy, peace, self-control, and all the others. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us to persevere. One of the tasks of the Holy Spirit is to assist Christians in persevering in the faith. Now, I think it was Grudem who said, uh, or somewhere I read it this way, only true Christians persevere, and only those who persevere are true Christians. And it has led to a massive debate in church history about what has become known as the perseverance of the saints. In other words, once saved, always saved. If you are a Christian, will you ever, can you lose your salvation? There's a huge debate among Christians, and it depends on where you are, uh, in terms of your understanding of God's role and my role. And it, it's similar to what we talked about election last week. Uh, to what extent is it up to God and to what extent is it up to me? And um, I'm not going to get into the debate tonight, but the one thing I do know is that the Holy Spirit has been given to me to enable me to do what I cannot do by myself. I cannot be a Christian by myself. As much as I cannot be born in this world by my own will, I can't, before I exist, even tell my parents, I want to be born, please. It doesn't work that way. I'm born into this life by someone else's desire and design. And, and then it is only, and, and it works that way in the spiritual realm as well. And it's then only by the power of the Holy Spirit in me and my submission to the Holy Spirit that I can and will persevere uh, in this life. And so my focus in terms of this debate is not whether a person can lose his or her salvation, which is a very real debate. We have to sometimes ask that question. But 
to me, the emphasis is on allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell in me. And to the extent that I do, and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm assured of my salvation, I believe that the Holy Spirit has been given to me to help me to persevere. And when I persevere, I am a Christian. And as a Christian, as a true Christian, I believe the Holy Spirit will help me to persevere. So the Holy Spirit's ministry is God with us. He reminds us of Jesus' words and work, said Jesus, as recorded in scriptures. And the Holy Spirit will not operate outside of the boundaries of, the, of this book, of the Bible. I believe this is God's final revelation. We've talked about that. I called it a foundation block when we talked about the revelation at the time. And, I, and, and that becomes now even more important when we begin to understand that the Spirit of God works in our lives. Now, the Spirit of God will uh, convict us, that he will, uh, he will revive us, He will speak to us, he, he continues to journey with us, He speaks to my spirit, but the Holy Spirit, I believe, will not move beyond the boundaries of this book. The principles and the guidelines that we find in the Bible uh, are the ones that the Holy Spirit will bring to our minds as we journey with Him. He is the one who convicts of sin, brings us uh, to salvation. He sanctifies us. He makes us holy. He empowers us to live for the Christian life and He equips us to be instruments in the hands of God and to be a blessing to the church and to the world. So, that's looking at who the Spirit is, the third person of the Trinity, God Himself, active in creation, active throughout the whole of the Old Testament, promised and then given on the day of Pentecost to be God with us. We've looked at the work of the Spirit. There are plenty of things. Ultimately, this, the Spirit's role is to journey with us from being an unsaved sinner all the way to becoming a Christian and then living with us on the journey of Christianity. And that is sanctifying us, uh, helping us to live out the characteristics of a Christian, the fruit of the Spirit, and then also empowering us to witness and giving us gifts that we need in order to serve other people around us. That leads us to some of the contentious issues regarding the Holy Spirit. Not all Christians agree on how and exactly how the Holy Spirit operates. The one area that has been a major area of contention is spirit baptism and the different views around that. I have not listed all of them, but just to give you a bit of an idea of the different kinds of beliefs. Some believe that the baptism with or in or by the Holy Spirit happens at conversion and is then followed by a relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, prefer, preferably referred to as uh, being filled with the Spirit. Very few people have a problem with that particular view and most people will agree with that. But there are some views that say you don't receive the Holy Spirit upon your conversion. You need to receive the Holy Spirit later on. And there, there are a whole range of different views around that. Some say you receive Him as a person, but not His power. You need to be empowered later on after your conversion. And so that is essentially the second major view. And that is, I become a Christian, and then at some point, hours, days, weeks, or months, or even years later, I then need to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so a standard question which is the question that Paul asks some of the disciples of John the Baptist in Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were converted? Or the question, have you ever been baptized with the Holy Spirit? So in some cases, people are asking for two dates, as it were. The date of your conversion to Christ and the date of your baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, and in many of those kinds of beliefs, the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a subsequent event will then be accompanied with a gift. Um, most often, it would be uh, the, the argument would be that those, pers those people need to speak uh, in tongues. Now, we have the examples in the book of Acts about that. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, they spoke in tongues. Uh, when the Samaritans came, became Christian and followers of Christ, the disciples were sent, apostles were sent, and they went down to Samaria to speak to them, and they prayed for them, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them, and then they spoke in tongues. And the same thing happened, uh, a similar kind of thing happened when Cornelius uh, and, uh, became a Christian. Cornelius, um, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is going 
and speaking to this Roman soldier, and as he speaks to the Gentiles, uh, it seems like conversion and baptism and the, and the speaking in tongues all happen simultaneously. Um, but uh, certainly there's evidence of that in the New Testament, and this would be the argument followed by the, those. There are others who believe, and I'm more comfortable with this, uh, that a combination of the two, two views is possible, and that Christians receive the Spirit at conversion, um, but that, we, that they need an ongoing relationship. In fact, I'm personally more comfortable with the first view, but there are those who believe that you need a, what has become known as a second blessing, and then that second blessing can or could be, and in some cases must be accompanied with um, with the, some gift which is uh, maybe the speaking in tongues or whatever. I don't know where you find yourself uh, on that spectrum. Uh, as I said to you, I hold views of my own, but I also appreciate the fact that there are other people who hold different views. My personal view is that the Holy Spirit as a person needs to come into my life and, and does come into my life at my conversion. I cannot have the Father and the Son, and not the Holy Spirit, because the Trinity is one. And I can't have two of the persons and not the third one. And therefore, I believe the Holy Spirit comes in my life at conversion. I would personally refer to that as a baptism, as my baptism in the Holy Spirit. I believe it needs to be followed by ongoing fillings with the Holy Spirit, and that is an ongoing process. I do believe that some people have a dynamic experience with the Holy Spirit. And in some cases, they would prefer to refer to that experience as their baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, at the end of the day, to me, the most important thing is that people live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So my question normally is not, when have you received the Holy Spirit, but are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because if you don't, then we need to pray for you. You need to pray that the Spirit comes upon you, fills you, and, and you need to then live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So to me, it's whether I live by the power of the Holy Spirit and not when I receive the Spirit. That, that to me is less of a question than whether He is actively present, uh, presently active in my life. A balanced approach, uh, this is the one that I would hold to. A sinner is convicted by the Spirit. Um, in, in other words, you become a Christian based on the work of the Spirit in your life. A Christian is baptized by the Spirit at conversion and that there is a strong need for an ongoing relationship with the Spirit. Some Christians may have that dynamic experience with the Spirit later on. I'm very, very pleased to, to hear that. And if that happens, I'm not going to argue with them and say, no, 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 it didn't happen with you. Uh, but I'm also very cautious to make another person's experience or even my own experience a standard ex uh, expectation for everybody. All Christians agree that they need and should seek the power of the Holy Spirit to live and to witness for God. Now, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, that's another very contentious issue. The Holy Spirit's role, among other things, uh, many other things, is to give gifts to the church and to the body so that Christ can be served and the kingdom of God can grow and extend. The main passages, as I said before, come from Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and there's also uh, a description of some gifts in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Um, I personally don't believe the lists are extensive uh, or complete or exhaustive. I think there are probably more gifts. I, I think we limit the Holy Spirit and God if we say these are the only gifts that are described. I think there may be other places in the Bible where other gifts are mentioned. The gifts are normally referred to uh, with the Greek word, which is charismata, and therefore charismatic gifts. And the whole charismatic movement uh, is based on this particular word. It goes back to the rise of the Pentecostal movement in the early part of the 20th century when there was a major Pentecostal revival. And many parts um, around the world, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and many other parts, uh, the charismatic and pen the Pentecostal and charismatic movements have really grown phenomenally. In terms of just a brief uh, description or definition of Pentecostal and charismatic, Pentecostal theology typically believe that you receive uh, Christ in your life, you become a Christian, and there's a subsequent baptism with the Holy Spirit. 
which needs to happen with the laying on of hands, and then as you receive the Spirit, you will then speak in tongues. That, that's your classical Pentecostal belief. Charismatic, the charismatic movement came out of the Pentecostal be belief or movement in the sense that they said, um, most of, uh, the, by, by and large, charismatic churches say, no, you receive the Holy Spirit as a person at your conversion. But we do believe that there is a baptism necessary, and it may or may not necessarily be accompanied with the gift of tongues, um, but there is a very strong emphasis in charismatic churches on the application and the implementation of, of the gifts in general in the church uh, of Jesus Christ. Some of the disagreements about the gifts uh, include uh, whether the gifts still operate, um, whether we can still today say the gifts are there, or whether they have actually ceased to exist. And uh, if you believe that the gifts no longer operate, we refer to you as a cessationist. The gifts cease to exist at some point in time. The argument being that during the early part of Christianity, there was no Bible, there was no Christian Bible. And therefore, God was still revealing Himself through prophecy, and people like Paul and Peter and others were still prophesying, speaking, receiving more and more information and revelation. But by the time the Bible was complete, and oftentimes they would refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when what is complete has arrived, we will know in full. And they will say that, that is a reference to the Bible. And therefore we no longer need gifts such as prophecy or tongues. And, and then uh, in the same argument, oftentimes uh, there is no room for the Holy Spirit uh, gifts to, to operate. So those are cessationists. Um, and then others would say no, and I've just explained that in the Pentecostal and in the Charismatic movement, uh, and many others who wouldn't, would not call themselves Charismatic uh, people necessarily, believe that um, the gifts still operate and must and should uh, operate even today, but they, they differ on the extent to which the gifts operate and also the kinds of gifts and when and how they operate. Uh, in the world today or in the, in the Christian world today. There's normally quite a bit of debate around what I call the spectacular gifts, and I'm really referring to tongues, prophecy, and healing. Uh, those are the more upfront, spectacular gifts. Uh, more often than not, when a person has a gift of administration, which is a gift, by the way, and the person sits somewhere stuck away in an office, uh, it's not very spectacular. And nobody is going to argue that this person has a gift of administration or management and operating somewhere out there. It is when a person stands up in an audience and speaks in a tongue, glossolalia, or the person stands up and says, I have a word from God, a prophecy that I need, or the person says, I'm going to pray for someone to have healing. Those gifts are spectacular. In other words, they're very public. They're out there. They're open. And uh, it's on those three gifts that uh, people have ma major differences. Tongues can be described as the gift to communicate in an unknown language. The Greek word is glossolalia, uh, which means tongues or languages. Prophecy is the gift of hearing and interpreting God's voice. Primarily, if you look at the Old Testament, for a given situation, God is saying to us X, Y, Z, for now, for here but it can also have a future element, as you, if you look at the Old Testament. And then healing is the special gift of praying for and bringing about physical healing for the sick. We, we're not talking about gen generically praying, oh Lord, please um, heal so-and-so who is sick or in hospital. We're talking about the boldness of bringing a person to the front or laying on of hands and saying, uh, you, are, you are healed in Jesus' name. So we're talking about a special gift uh, of healing in this regard. Just uh, some thoughts, and, and really they're only very brief thoughts, because we're talking here about topics in their own right, and uh, many, many volumes of books written and, and arguments from different angles about how these things should be operating. When it comes to tongues, my own biblical response to that, and I believe this is biblical, is that tongues and prophecies or prophecy are compared by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. We have the benefit of a church who seem in Corinth to have abused the, the gifts. 
And when Paul writes to them, he's making a correction because they have abused it. And we now have the benefit of reading chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians um, uh, to, to help us and guide us and to understand what it is. When I read it, the difference between prophecy and tongues, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm saying in my opinion, is that prophecy seems to be God speaking to a modern audience and a, a, a human audience. Tongues seem to be the gift to communicate with God uh, or about God in such a way that God is glorified. So primarily, if I read 1 Corinthians 14, I believe tongues is speaking to God or about God in such a way that God is glorified, and that prophecy is the ability to speak in, in our particular context, it would be in English. In other words, that God will not, not use a foreign language to speak to us, because we all speak English, uh, as I'm doing right now, and we're all on the same page. If God wants to speak to us, He will use English. And then, when it comes to the gift of healing, that God is the healer and that any gift operating in this regard should function in humility. And the focus is on God. I have, therefore, a problem when I see people being invited and you will see healing and you will see miracles if you come to this and that and the other uh, meeting. Uh, something inside of me is just objecting to the lack of humility by simply going around and, and praying for a person, not denying for one single moment that a person can have the gift of healing, and secondly, that it is God who does the healing. I believe that God can do that healing in any possible way, whether it is through the medical science, which is God's ability for people to design uh, medical signs and, and uh, medication and operations and all sorts of things to bring about restoration and healing, which is what God helps us to do. But God can also miraculously bring healing in the life of a person. If that happens, we need to be so quick to simply give the glory to God and step out of the way. So I have a bit of a problem if I arrive here, and I, you should have a problem if I arrive here. I am the healer. You know, the healing is in me, and I'm the gift person here, and I'm going to heal everybody in this audience tonight who has some kind of an illness. I, I personally have a problem with that. I don't see that operating in the Bible in that same way. Some of the guidelines that I believe we should apply, uh, first of all, is that gifts are gifts. They are called charismata from the word in Greek called charis or the, the Greek word charis means a gift. It's exactly what it is. It is not something that I claim. It's not something I buy. In fact, Simon the sorcerer, when Peter went to Samaria, was heavily reprimanded by Peter when he wanted to pay money in order to have this gift of giving the Holy Spirit to, to different people. He said, it is a free gift. I can pray for a gift. God has the ability to say, no, I don't want to give you that gift. I also believe that God gives, the Spirit gives as He, the Spirit, determines. In other words, I don't necessarily believe that all the gifts will always operate in all churches. Because God knows the circumstances and He knows the situation in every single local church. Therefore, I believe that God will give to that local church what He knows is necessary for them. It is very clear in the Scriptures that God, the Holy Spirit, gives as He determines. And therefore, I don't believe that one single gift is the sign of the Holy Spirit. In other words, speaking in tongues is not the sign that I have the Holy Spirit. I, I believe it's one of the gifts given to some people uh, for whatever reason. They are given primarily to serve the body of Jesus Christ. That is clear from 1 Corinthians 12, um, that I use my gift in the body to grow the body. I don't, I don't use it to receive glory for myself. Not all Christians receive the same gift. And there is no one gift that is a requirement for all Christians in order to prove that they are filled or baptized by the Holy Spirit. I, I'm, I'm very clear in my mind on that particular issue. I believe that there are some gifts that may operate, and I want to say may, or they seem to operate in a missionary environment more dramatically. Miracles and signs and wonders seem, and I only say seem, when you read church history, when there's a new frontier that is approached and people need some kind of a proof that, that there is a God and God works in a miraculous way. 
they, there seemed to be more opportunity then for some of these kind of signs and miracles to happen in that environment. Um, whether that's true or not, I, I can't necessarily prove. But then there are some gifts that also seem to work better in the private life. Uh, when you read through 1 Corinthians 14, uh, Paul seems to be saying that in the, in the public in, in environment, in the public ministry, it is better to speak and to quote him five words that people understand than a thousand that they don't. In other words, in the public arena where the church is gathered, it is better to speak to the congregation in words that they will understand. If you then do speak in tongues, and, and again to, to, uh, to remind you of my interpretation, the tongue is speaking to God, then you also need to pray that there will be someone who can interpret that. In other words, to tell the rest of the congregation what I have just prayed, if I, if I pray in a tongue or speak in a tongue, so that the other people can join in bringing praise and honor and glory to God, rather than sitting there not knowing what really is happening when there is a tongue. And so in that sense, Paul says, uh, by all means, you have, a, you have a gift, the gift of tongues, uh, use it, practice it, but do it for your own benefit, maybe somewhere uh, in your private uh, capacity where you can grow as a Christian. As a result of that, you may be a better instrument when you come back and serve the church. When it comes to a relationship with the Holy Spirit, there are some negative responses when people resist the Holy Spirit by not believing in Jesus Christ. Some go further, they reject the Holy Spirit and His work. And then Jesus calls that the unpardonable sin. That is the unpardonable sin. That is when I reject the Holy Spirit. I do not want to be convicted of my sin. I reject Jesus. Uh, it's the role of the Holy Spirit to bring me to Jesus. If I reject that, I'm essentially saying I, I don't want the Holy Spirit or God in my life. And it is possible for a Christian to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 the context refers to grave sins that I commit against Jesus or against God. And in that sense, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that I have committed the unpardonable sin because I can still come back in repentance and serve God. I can respond positively to the Holy Spirit and His work in my life. Sinners who heed the call of God and the Holy Spirit, um, they become Christians, they heed the call of God, they respond positively. They repent of their sins and they are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Christians, on an ongoing basis, uh, can learn to discern the voice of the Spirit when He convicts us of sin. We always need to have that openness. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me where the sin is in my life. And as, I, as the Holy Spirit speaks to me, most often in a gentle voice, He will remind me of what the sin is in my life. And then I will be able to find forgiveness. Praying for the power of the Spirit to be a witness, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Praying for a dynamic relationship with the Spirit by continuously being filled uh, with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. And seeking to serve the body of Christ with my gift. Uh, what is the gift, Holy Spirit, that you've given me? And I want to serve you. I want to serve the body uh, with my gift. And then seeking to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Again and again and again, we need to ask the question, how do I measure up? When it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, do I have joy? Do I have peace? Uh, do I have love? Do I have uh, endurance and, and, and the gifts, uh, the, the fruit mentioned over there? Now, when things go wrong, some of the common errors related to the Holy Spirit, some wrong beliefs and emphases, one is simply denying the Holy Spirit's divinity. That has been true through ages. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the deity of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that He is God. And in a similar way, they don't believe that Jesus is God. They only believe in one, there's only one person, and that is God, Jehovah. And that's why they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. An overemphasis on some gifts, um, that only those who speak in tongues have received the Holy Spirit. And that's held by some extreme Pentecostal groups. It's not as popular as it used to be, but there are still some extreme uh, Pentecostal groups who would say um, that only if you speak in tongues and you have that particular gift, you have proof of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then an overemphasis on prophecy, claiming that the Holy Spirit speaks today directly from the mouths of prophets. 
Mormons believe this, and there are extreme versions of Mormons where the priest or um, the prophet, actually it's called the prophet, he's the leader of the community, he hears from God, he says to everybody what God is saying. Uh, in fact, he will tell you whom to marry. Uh, and he will take a young girl and give it, give it to a, a man because God told him that this woman belongs to that man, that sort of thing. So that's an overemphasis on prophecy. And then dividing the Trinity, uh, there, is, um, there was a, a strong movement called Armstrong, or started by a, a man, Herbert Armstrong, Armstrongism. And uh, he believed and taught that only when you go through water baptism do you receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Spirit before the time, but when you are baptized in water, then you receive the Holy Spirit, which is obviously a false uh, teaching as well. Now, there's some musical expressions of our faith. Uh, uh, there's a hymn that says, You've poured out your Spirit, great Father of life, your presence, your power, the Spirit of Christ, the fruit of His triumph, the breath of His life, of His love, the proof He has risen and reigns now above. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love and do what Thou wouldst do. And a more modern prayer, and a hymn, Come, breath of life, and cause our hearts to rise. Come, make us strong before Your searching eyes. O breath of life, renew us in Your ways. Come, sweeping in and set Your church ablaze, which is a prayer. I want to challenge you uh, as we do these studies that, that it's not just academic knowledge, but that you actually take this, the, the truths that we have been talking about and apply it to your life. Um, the first thing you need to do as a Christian is say, Lord, Holy Spirit, where is the sin in, in my life that you want me to convict uh, me of? And then confess it and, and ask the Spirit to help you to live a sanctified, a holy life. Be filled with the Spirit to produce fruit. Be filled with, this, with the power of the Spirit to be a witness and to be filled with the Spirit so that you can use your gift, whatever gift the Holy Spirit has given you, to bless the church and to bless others around you. Next time we're going to look at the church and uh, what is the church, uh, who is the church, um, and then some of the history of the church and so on we'll be looking at. And I'll see you next week. Go and live in the power of the Holy Spirit.